Okay, so now I'd like to uh, take all the stuff we've done up to, up to now and talk about uh, some design guidelines and picking appropriate uh, parameters for design. Um, got a lot of learning objectives this one. Um, we're going to talk at the beginning about some common failure, uh, uh, failure conditions and wall performance, and I think it's really instructive to see uh, where we've historically had failures. Um, and uh, we'll talk about what kind of foundation and backfill soils um, cause problems. So you should be able to identify those. Uh, we'll, we'll, uh, in fact, I'll do a little example problem on water. So uh, you should uh, understand why water is a big issue for us and then be able to properly calculate uh, water loads on the wall. And then um, depending on what kind of a wall system you have and the stiffness of the wall system, you should be able to pick the appropriate type of uh, method for computing the, the design earth pressures. I'm going to very specifically talk about uh, review total stress and um, effective stress analyses, which, which should be a review for most people, but it's really important that you understand when you, can use, when you should be using one and when you should be using another. Uh, and then for the, total, for the total stress analysis, I'll be talking about some of the guidelines that are in the FHWA manual about what uh, the wall friction cohesion value should be. Uh, and the, I'm sorry, for, an effect, for a total stress analysis. And for an effective stress analysis, we'll talk about what the appropriate angles of wall friction delta are for um, effective stress analyses, uh, and then be able to calculate the, the water uh, pressures. And finally, um, we've already talked about this a couple times, but we'll talk about um, lateral, lateral earth pressures in layered systems. There was a really interesting paper um, um, that Peck wrote. It's been quite a long. It's been quite a while ago, um, and I haven't seen an, an equivalent one since then. Dun Duncan uh, represented this. And I don't. Did we read the Duncan paper? I don't. I don't think we did. It was a summary of. It was. Um, so it. It was. It was a summary paper in one of the Earth Retention conferences. Um, but what, what, what Peck looked at. So this is you know 50, 60 years ago now looked at all the retaining wall failures that he could find. Um, and the first thing he did is he classified them uh, in terms of the types of failures. You can see them here. The vast majority of them were uh, walls, there are very few walls that just had a, a complete uh, and utter failure, although 18% of them did. Uh, very few walls that just failed immediately, but most of the ones that, that, that you'd classify as not performing well had what, what he classified as pro progressive uh, sliding or tilting. In other words, it took quite a while. They just, but they, there, were, there was a lot of creep involved. 14% um, of them, he said he didn't know what they were. Um, and there was a, around 10% that initially there was some significant movement, but then they, then, then they stabilized. And then some that settled a lot under the backfill. And of those ones that were um, progressive or sliding failure, he looked at uh, the, the difference, the, the types of soils in the backfill and in the foundation. So generally when you're building a built wall, um, you have some foundation soil down here and you, then you backfill it with something else. So you generally have two soils here. You have, you have your backfill and you have your foundation soil. And it's, it's real important when you do design that you distinguish between those, particularly if you're doing a fill wall, because you've got control over the backfill and you have some or little or no control over the, over the foundation wall. So I'll take you a minute to look at that and let that sink in. So where are most of the, most of the failures coming from? Okay, yeah, yeah. Walls that are built on clay foundation and have clay backfill. Okay, and the, the second biggest problem is ones where he couldn't tell from the, the data he had what they were. So let's just put those in the clay clay group. And, and we're, we're now up to almost 70% of the problems, right? Either whether the, the material was unknown or undocumented, 
or you're, built, you're, you're, you're building on clay and you've got a clay wall behind it. So that should, that should tell you something right away. Okay, then what's the next, the next biggest one? Next biggest one is 17%, and what's that? So you've got your backfill material is a good material, but your foundation material is clay, all right? And then the next, the next one is where you have clay backfill, right? But you've got sand or gravel or rock for a foundation, and then there's an unknown one. So what do you not see up there in walls that have been a problem? Yeah, walls that have a cohesionless material for the base and a cohesionless material for the backfill. So there's a lot, I mean, th this, is a, this is an old slide, but there's a lot of really good information in that from, a, you know, there's a 30,000 look at it. But we basically don't have a lot of problems if we have good foundation soil and good backfill soil. So, those of you that, if you're, if you're designing at a point where you've got clays, then you should worry. All right, let's talk about some really simple basic guidelines for selecting material type. Um, you should always be using granular, cohesionless, well-draining backfills if, when it's possible. That's an always do. If you have weak foundation soils, if you have clay soils that are weak foundation soils, then you should think about putting your, your wall on a deep foundation that will support it properly. Because when, when it comes to the foundation soils, you don't have as much choice. The backfill soils, you've got some choice about what you put back there, and, and you should exercise that choice. Uh, and if you do put it on a deep foundation, you should make sure that you actually check the global stability. I saw a really nice case history, I may have mentioned this before, where there was a slope that want, they wanted to steepen, so they came in here and, and, they, and they, they tried to design, you know, they, they wanted, to, they wanted to, to put a big retaining wall back here and, and uh, so they could steepen the slope. And they realized that one was going to fail. There's no way they could do that. So they decided what they were going to do instead of doing that was to come in and build, I think it was three small walls. So they could, they could, they could build a little wall here. They could cut that. Then they could build another little wall here. And then they could come down and build a third little wall here. And that would work fine. Because each of the walls individually was stable. That was a great thing. And guess what happened? The whole thing failed like that. Because they, they couldn't do it. I mean, the slope wasn't stable. And putting a lot of little walls up didn't help. But, uh, e the, the, but the, analysis for each, the analysis for each wall was fine. So you've got to remember to check global stability. Um, if, you, if you have compressible foundations, then you better check this, do a settlement analysis. You remember from the, the um, field uh, case history we looked at on Tuesday, that was the, uh, the magnitude of settlement wasn't particularly large, but, but did you notice how much settlement there was behind the wall compared to in front of the wall? And that was actually for, for a, a, a cohesionless um, sand um, foundation soil. So imagine if you actually had you know, a, a significantly compressible soil. So if you've got compressible soils, it's critical that you do a settlement analysis and make sure that your settlements are going to be satisfactory. If your clay backfill is unavoidable, this mostly happens in cut walls. There's, there's very little excuse for not having, um, being able to put in a good backfill material if, you, if you're doing a, a, a fill wall. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons to do that. Um, but if it's unavoidable, which usually happens in cut walls because you're not removing the material behind the wall, then uh, you need to do both a short-term analysis with vehicle zero conditions, which we'll talk about in just a minute if you can't remember what that means. And don't forget to do a long-term stability analysis under drain conditions, particularly if you're doing a cut wall, because if you're doing a cut wall, you're reducing the, the pressure, which means you're going to generate negative excess pore pressures if you have a dense soil, which means over time the, 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 the strength of the soil is going to decrease. So don't forget to do both analyses. If you're, in a, if you're in a place or conditions where you have expansive clay soils behind your wall and you, you can't do anything about it, then you need to 
estimate the swell pressures and design for the swell pressures. This is particularly true in basement walls and stuff. You see a lot of problems with basement walls in places where people have uh, expansive soils because they, they, don't, they don't remove the soils or it's too expensive to remove the soils. Uh, so if you're going to do that, then you'd better check the swell pressures and design for the swell pressures. All right, let's talk about drain versus undrained conditions because this is really, really important that you understand this. Um, so fundamentally, the shear strength of all soils is a function of the effective stress because it's the inner particle. The effective stress is that stress that's carried by the soil skeleton. It's that stress that's the inner particle stress. And shear strength is fun fundamentally a frictional behavior. So it's dependent on the the effective stress between particles. So we know that the, effect, the effective stress is, the to, is equal to the total stress minus the pore pressure. And then this, if we have a more Coulomb, um, our simplest model for the strength of the soil is a more Coulomb model. And that means the, the shear strength, S, is going to be able to whatever the, the, the drain cohesion value is, plus the effective stress times the drain friction angle. That's our material model. That's this, that's this. That's this model right there. We may or may not have cohesion. Well, we'd like, really, we should always do a, a drain analysis. And if we could, that would be what we'd prefer to do. Um, because if we know this, we know the effective stresses, we know the pore pressures, we can, I mean, I'm sorry, we know the total stresses, they're always easy to get. Getting total stresses is not hard. If we know the pore pressures, we can calculate the effective stress, we know the strength of the soil, it works all the time, it's not a problem. The trouble is we can't always do that. Um, when a soil undergoes shearing there, uh, and it's saturated, there's going to be volume, well there's always going to be volume change during shearing. If I have, I didn't bring my ping pong balls today, I should have bought them. If I have a dense soil like this, it's packed densely, in order for me to push this row over that row, these balls have to rise up and to slide over the top, and that's going to increase the volume of the soil. Or if I have a loose soil and I push them, these particles are going to fall between the other ones, and, and there's going to be a decrease in volume. So, so if you're shearing loose soils, they always compress, and if you're shearing dense soils, they always dilate. If the soils are saturated, then that dilation or that compression can't happen unless the water is going to flow out of them. And in, in order for the water to flow out of them, you've got to generate a pore pressure to push the water out. So you're going to generate an excess pore pressure. If you're in a compressive situation, you're going to generate a positive excess pore pressure. And if you're in a dilative situation, you're going to generate a negative excess pore pressure. Now, you're not changing the total stress when you're shearing. You're just changing the pore pressure. So since you're not changing the total stress, right, the, the, the equation is sigma prime is equal to sigma minus u. Right? The total stress isn't changing as, as the soil shears. But I'm going to change u, so what's going to change? The effective stress has to change. And if, if, if it's a case where you're, where you're shearing a loose or a soft soil, U is going to go up so that the effective stress is going to go down. If it's a case where you're shearing a dilative soil, U is going to go down so the effective stress is going to go up. But eventually, all of that excess pore pressure is going to go away. The trouble is, predicting the amount of excess pore pressure due to shear is, is essentially an impossible task for in the field. So we've got to have another way to do, so we've got to have another way to approach this, because I basically don't know you. If I don't know you, I don't know the effective stress. If I don't know the effective stress, then I can't use this strength envelope because I don't know the effective stress. So what's a geotechnical engineer to do? 
Well, our solution is to use a um, our solution is to use a total stress analysis. Um, so when we when if we're in a sand or a gravel, then the hydraulic conductivity is usually high, and so this excess pore pressure that that gets generated during shear di uh, disappears very quickly. In fact, it it disappears as quickly as we can do our construction. So essentially, in these cases, um, the excess pore pressure is equal to zero for all practical purposes. And we can use an effective stress analysis. And the, the pore pressure we're going to put in is just the static pore pressure. I say static. It should be, I, could say, I should say steady state. Because it could be static, or it could be due to, a, it, it could be due to flow. So it's really the steady state pore pressure. We could have a flow net. The point is we, we have some way to calculate the flows where we know what they are. Now for saturated clays, um, K is not small. I mean, K is very small. And it's so small that some of the excess pore pressure is not going to dissipate during the time that we're constructing. In some cases, it could take years or even decades for the excess pore pressure to dissipate. So obviously, it's not going to occur during construction. So what's a person to do? Well, we're going to go back to the one thing we know. We're going to say, well, let's assume that none of the pore pressures dissipate. Because no, initially, they don't. So we're going to assume none of the pore pressures dissipate. Well, if this was the initial effective stress that we were at, and then this is the initial strength that we had. Right? That was the initial effective stress that we were under. Then that's the initial strength that we had before we did any construction. Well, if there's no change, if, if we assume um, that there's no change in the effective stress, in other words, when we put a load on the soil, when we put some load on the soil, sigma uh, prime is equal to sigma minus u. And then we're going to add a delta sigma on there, either because we're, we're loading the soil or, we're, or we're, 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 we're excavating and we're unloading on one side, we're building on the other side. Well, if there's no drainage, then this can't change, which means all the change has to happen. Whatever, all, all the, all, whatever happens here has to be happened to you in order for sigma prime not to change. This is the assumption that we're using when we do a total stress analysis. So if there's no change uh, in the effective stress, then whatever strength the soil had before is still there. So this effective stress, let's say we were at a state uh, initially where we had this sigma prime plus some u naught and we had this total stress. So this is sigma. But we have this effective, we still have this strength. We're not going to call this the undrained shear strength, SU. We had this total stress. Now, if I add some delta sigma to the, to the, to the left-hand side, if I add to the right-hand side some delta sigma and some u, I'm going to, and, and u excess is going to be equal to delta sigma, I'm going to get a new total stress out here. This is going to be sigma plus delta sigma. This is a total stress. But my effective stress isn't going to have changed, so I haven't changed. I, I don't, I'm not consolidating, so I don't get any more strength. So I'm still going to have the same strength, SU. Conversely, if I unloaded to a total stress down here, so this is sigma minus delta sigma, I'm not going to the soil is not going to have a chance to dilate, so the effective stress is not going to decrease. And I have the same strength, SU. This is what we call the classic phi equals zero conditions. Now, this is an assumption we're making. This may or may not actually be true. This is an assumption we're making. But these are assumptions we're making when we do a total stress analysis. So in, in the short term, if we're doing a total stress analysis, we're assuming that, we, that there is no change in effective stress due to any kind of loading that we apply. And so that there's no, if there's, the soil is neither expanding nor contracting. 
If there's no expansion or contraction to the soil, if it's not dilating or it's not consolidating, then there's no change to the strength. There's no change to the effective stress, there's no change to the strength. And if there's no change to the strength, then we have whatever strength we had before. And so we're going to use this model that the shear strength is equal to the undrained shear strength plus the total stress. Notice that's the total stress times the tangent of phi. Well, this is zero. And we're just going to be left with that the shear strength is equal to the undrained shear strength. So that was the undrained shear strength we had before we started. Now, over time, that excess pore pressure is going to dissipate. And then we're going to get back to the static conditions. And then we'll, now we'll be back to S is equal to C, uh, C plus sigma tan phi. But our strength will have changed, because the soil will either have consolidated if we were generating po positive excess pore pressures, or if we were generating negative excess pore pressures, the, the, soil, will have the soil will have dilated. So if it consolidated, the strength will have gone up. If it dilated, the strength will go down. So as long as we get the new strength parameters, um, so if we're, doing a, if we're doing a built wall, for instance, in a built wall, we're almost always going to have an increase in strength afterwards, because we're putting a bunch of fill behind the wall that's going to be a big increase in total stress, and the wall is going to consolidate behind there. And eventually, the strength is going to go up. But if we're doing a cut wall, well, we're unloading the soil on one side. That soil eventually is going to swell. When it swells, the effective stress is you know, it's, it's swelling. The effective stress is going down it's actually going to have a lower strength. So it's critical that we have the, the correct strength parameters afterwards. But if we get the correct C and C prime and, ta and, and phi prime afterwards, in the, in the long term, we can send our, our pore pressures back to U static or U steady state, whichever is appropriate, and we can do an effective stress analysis. So there's, two, there's actually two assumptions that are really, uh, or two parts of this that are really critical. One is, this business, this phi equals zero condition is really an assumption. What it means is, in the field, the soil, when, when we load or unload the soil or change the shear stress in the soil, there's going to be excess pore pressures generated. We don't know what those are. But what we're going to do is we're going to take a sample of the soil out of the field, we're going to bring it back to the lab, and we're going to test it under undrained conditions. Or we're going to do a direct test, we're going to do a, 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 an undrained test in the field. We'll do, a, we'll do a vein shear test or some kind of other test in the field to get the undrained strength. We're assuming, now when we bring that sample back to the lab, it's easier to think of, we bring that sample back to the lab, we put it in a triaxial device or something, and we load it undrained, it, it's, the pore pressures are going to change in that too. We're just not going to measure them. We're just going to load it undrained and calculate the, the undrained shear strength. So we're assuming that whatever happens in the lab is what's happening in the field. That may or may not be true. But what's most important is that we get the samples from, that we're going to test from the appropriate location because we're, you know, we, we can't take the samples from any place to get the undrained shear strength. Uh, you know, if we're doing drain conditions, we can take the samples from a lot of places, and as long as we have the drain parameters, life is good. But, but the, sh the, the undrained shear strength that you have at any given location is dependent on whatever the consolidation stress was that was at. If you go down and, and take a sample from a much deeper location where the consolidation stress was higher, and this is, this is the sigma prime that you're using, you're going to get this undrained shear strength. But the area that you're, you're concerned about is at some higher level in the ground, and it has a lower consolidation stress. It has a lower undrained shear strength. So it's very, very critical when you're doing undrained tests that you get the samples from the right location, the right material. Because you're making the assumption that whatever happens in the lab is happening in the field, and you're not measuring pore pressures. You're not calculating effective stress parameters. This is really almost an index property. And then, when you go back at, at, at t equals infinity to do your drained analysis, you have to realize that the strength parameters will have changed, and you've got to get the right strength parameters. The strength parameters may have changed. They may not have. OK, now let's talk about how strength parameters can change over time. So this is the, drain, this is the drained and undrained analysis. 
Vehicle zero conditions short term uh, for saturated clays. Uh, drain analysis anytime appropriate for um, free, freely draining gravels and sands and for the long term in the clays. Oops, going the wrong way. All right, let's talk about how the strength parameters can actually change over time. Okay, let's pretend we had just have, you can think of this as a direct shear test or triaxial test, I don't care. Um, if, we're, if we're shearing a soil like a loose sand or a, a uh, normally consolidated clay, um, these clays are strain hardening, or these materials are strain hardening, and if I, you can think of this, like, as I say, uh, this could be shear strain if it's a triaxial test, or if you want to think of it as uh, lateral displacement in a direct shear test, that's fine. We know that, that we'll, we'll pick up shear stress, and we'll pick up shear stress, and eventually we'll reach some peak like that, and, and that'll be our peak. And we'll do one test. So this will be a test at, uh, at the normal stress uh, of, you know, some normal stress one. We'll do a second test at a higher normal stress, and we'll get another peak value. So this would be, this will be S1. We do it, this will be someone at sigma prime is two, and we'll get a higher, higher one here. This is going to be a, uh, sigma two. I'll do one at a lower stress here. And we'll get one at, I'll just call it, uh, oh, that's not sigma one, that's S, sorry. Shear strength, this is, this is three. And this will be done at some sigma prime three. So in my scenario, this would have been, this would have, we will take our sigma prime one, this will be the point one, and the shear strength we got at one. This is the one we got at two. This is point two, this is point three in my little scenario. And we're gonna draw a failure envelope there. We're gonna calculate phi prime. And that'll be our um, uh, shear, our, our strength envelope. Uh, for loose sands and for normally consolidated clays, we will see little or no cohesion, so it's, it's appropriate just to fit it through the, the center of the curve. And we'll have this shear strength. The shear strength is simply uh, the normal stress times tangent of phi, or if we want to call it phi peak, uh, we can just say it's the normal stress times the tangent of phi peak. So you've probably all done this test in, in, uh, in your undergraduate class. Uh, with dense sands or with overconsolidated clays, the story is a little different. Remember, with dense sands, let me go back to this picture. So, this is our picture for loose sands or or normally consolidated clays. In that case, as we shear the soil, the soil is going to compress and it's going to it's just going to gain strength until it reaches its peak strength. If we have a dense material, it's initially going to have some, some strength, but as it dilates, you can see that the particles, if you think about this as a sand, the particles are going to actually, it's actually going to lose strength, because you've got to overcome this, this, this rise of height up to there, and then when you get up here, you just got the sliding friction. So we're going to what's going to happen if we test a, um, a dense sand, It's, we're going to get some peak strength, but if we continue to shear it after that, we're going to come down to some residual strength after that that's lower than that. Because it's going to dilate, and then it's going to reach its maximum volume, and then it's going to be at its peak strength, and then the, the, the strength is actually going to go down after that. And again, I could do three of these tests at three different uh, normal stresses, and I might get one that looks like that, one that looks like this, and a third one that looks like this. And I can now take two string, I can take two values off of each of these. I can take a peak and a residual value off of each one of these. And now I can, I can plot two failure envelopes. I have two failure envelopes now. Again, they'll have no cohesion intercept. I'll have a peak envelope and I'll have a residual envelope. So I have two different uh, uh, strengths of a peak strength, which is equal to sigma prime times tangent, tangent phi prime. And I'll have a residual strength, which is going to be sigma prime times the uh, residual angle. It gets even more complicated when we get into um, overconsolidated clays. 
So when I test overconsolidated clays, there's actually three str different strength levels I'm going to get. We'll get a peak strength, just like um, we did in the sands. And it will come down, and fairly quickly, it'll come down to something that looks pretty close to asymptotic. And at that point, we're going to we're going to give it a name that we call the fully softened strength. The, the full name for this is, I'll explain that in a minute, fully softened. And that'll occur at, that'll, that'll occur like maybe 2 to 3 percent strain or something like that. Maybe less than that even. But if I continue to shear out, and I put this, I put this discontinuity in there for a long, long time to displacements of like inches, at least several centimeters, then I'll get an even lower strength that we call the residual strength. And this is the strength, for instance, you see on these landslides we get in Southern California. You see these old landslides that are reactivated. Where if you, go, just, if you, don't, you don't know what those are, just go down to Portuguese Bend sometime. Take your friends, get a picnic, put your swimsuits on, head down to San Pedro, go and drive through Portuguese Bend. You'll see a slide there. And you, and you can look up. And you can, that, that slide has moved tens and tens of feet. Uh, and if you have that much movement on it, you'll, you actually take the clay particles that are flat and they kind of line up parallel along the shear surface and you get this even lower strength called residual strength. Um, but that happens at a really large displacement, a displacement beyond what you're going to get. It's going to be way beyond failure for most walls. So you may never get to that point. So th we might want to use all, all, any one of these uh, envelopes. Um, you're going to have three different envelopes in this case. Your peak strength is going to have the highest friction angle, and it's also going to have some cohesion. And this is going to be a um, um, this is not a this, this is not, necess not necessarily apparent cohesion, but there's going to be some cohesion, and, it, and it's an effective stress cohesion. Both your um, fully softened strength and your residual strengths have so little cohesion that we generally, th we, well, for the residual strength, you'll have no cohesion. And even for the fully softened strength, there might be a little bit of cohesion. We usually ignore it. So you're going to end up with, with uh, envelopes. You're going to end with a fully softened envelope and with a residual strength envelope. And so now we're going to have three different strengths. We're going to have the peak strength, which is going to have both cohesion and friction. We're going to have a fully softened strength, which will be a function just of the fully softened friction angle. And we'll have a residual strength, which is just a function of the residual. And we're going to have to decide when to use each of those. So I think, I think I'll finish this summary, because it'll be a better place to stop. Uh, and then we'll take our break. So uh, a quick summary. Um, if you're dealing with saturated, this is for saturated clays. For, the, for sands and gravels, it's pretty simple. We're going we're gonna to use our. Um, our, our drain analysis, but um, you're going to use, um, you've got to perform a short, short term analysis with V equals zero conditions and the pre construction undrained strength. And, you, and that, that, that undrained strength is going to vary with the depth, even in a uniform soil, it's going to vary with depth, so you've got to be sure to get the undrained strength parameters uh, at the appropriate places within your, within your wall design. So, and that's what this says. So the, the SU will depend on the consolidation stress. So you've got to get samples, either your lab samples, your in situ samples have to be from the appropriate, appropriate locations. Uh, for permanent cut wall systems, for permanent cut wall systems, you need to perform a long-term analysis. If you have, very, if you have temporary uh, shoring, you might, you might get away with performing just a, a short-term analysis because you're not, you may not have a significant drainage during the life of the structure. But if you've got a permanent wall, particularly for a cut wall, you need to perform a, a long-term analysis because in a cut wall, you're going to be decreasing the stress, so you're going to be decreasing the strength. Um, so for normally consolidated soils, it's perfectly appropriate just to use the peak uh, shear strength with no cohesion, you're just going to be going in with a different effective stress. For over-consolidated soils, you probably should be using the fully softened strength because there's not, it doesn't take too much strain to get to the fully softened strength. There, if you're sure your displacements won't reach the, um, um, 
If, you, if you're sure you're not going to get very, very much displacements, you can try using the peak strength with your, with your peak uh, cohesion. But you'd better be sure that you've got some, some condition that's going to keep you from getting to those strains. Because that's a, it's a fairly small strain. Less than 1% strain will get you to the peak. Now, if, you're doing, if you've got some kind of a, 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 a system that's braced or locked out, you know, you've got tie, permanent tiebacks, or you have a brace that's, you know, you've got a basement wall that's going to be braced, then maybe that's appropriate. But you'd better be careful. If there's a reason um, for really large uh, displacements, which for any kind of a practical wall design is probably not the case, but would, what might happen is you might be in a, in a situation where you're designing a wall in a place where there's already been large displacements, and there is a predefined shear zone where you could get residual shear strengths, then you need to use residual shear strengths. But most often, for overconsolidated clays, you're going to be looking at something like this fully softened strength. That would be that would be probably the most common design parameter to be using. And at that point, we'll take a break. All right, let's talk about uh, water effects. Um, and um, we're talking about horizontal water table, i.e., no flow. So I have this little example problem, which is just a really nice little instructive problem to go through. Um, so here's a, uh, we're just going to calculate the active earth pressure on a wall here. Um, horizontal, we're just going to use uh, Rankine theory. Um, K active is 1 minus sine phi over 1 plus sine phi. If uh, you got a 30 degree friction angle, that's a nice one to use just because it's easy to calculate. The active earth pressure is 1 third. The total active force is 1 half times 1 third times 20 squared times 110 pounds per cubic foot. And you get 7.3 kips per foot uh, of your wall into the board. Now what happens if the soil is saturated to the ground surface? Well remember, so we, we still have the same K active, right? K, K active hasn't changed. Um, so, we, so our act, the total active earth force is still 1 half times 1 third times 20 squared. But now it's, remember, that the horizontal force, sigma x is equal to sigma, it's sigma x prime is equal to sigma z times c times prime times k. So we've got to multiply by, uh, it's going to be the buoyant unit weight. And that's going to give us 3.2 kips per foot. We've got a whole lot less earth pressure, right? But what else do we have acting on this wall? We've got water pressure. Right? And our water pressure force is going to be 1 half times 1, because the, 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 the lateral earth pressure coefficient for water is 1 times 20 squared times 62.4. That's 12.5. And when you add those together, you're going to get 15, you're going to get 16 kips per foot, which is almost, which is more than twice what you had when there was no water behind the slope. So why do we worry about water? <laughs> this is why we worry about water. So there's, there's, a, there's, there's two things important about this. One, it should just be very apparent to you that you've got to deal with water. Water is important. If you don't do it, you don't get it right. Second one, don't forget that this is how you calculate the earth pressure. You calculate the earth pressure based on the, the effective stresses. When you want the total stress, you've got to go add the water pressure back in. Don't forget to do that. Very, very important. What about if we have steady state flow? So here's a, here, here's a potential uh, uh, excavation, temporary support excavation. It's in sand. We've got some kind of pump system or, or in here, and we've drawn the water table down. And this is, we now got flow, right? So we, this also, we, you know, this, there's clearly some pump system down here that's pumping water out. Uh, well, let's look at a, um, a, a Coulomb earth pressure problem here. We're going to have a, we're going to pick some potential failure surface. Uh, we're going to have some weight acting on that surface. We'll still have our normal and shear forces acting on that surface. But now we have another force acting on the surface. So what's the other force acting on that surface? The water pressure. I, from my flow net, I can calculate the water pressure acting on that surface. 
And I'm going to have some, P, some PU, which is the force that's applied by, by the, uh, the, the water pressure there. That's all acting on that surface. And in addition, by the way, this PU is also reducing the effective stress along there, which is going to change your shear strength. But this one, we can't use those simple earth pressure analyses. The, the, the classic earth pressure per, uh, uh, applies, but we can't use those simple analyses we did because we don't have a constant water pressure versus depth. So the only way you can do this analysis when you have steady state flow, you can still use earth pressure theory, but you've got to use either the Coulomb wedge analysis like this, which will allow you to account for the water forces, or you've got to use some computer-based analysis that allows you to calculate. You can still use a limit equilibrium method with, with, with uh, um, Coulomb earth pressure theory, but because the pore pressure is not simple to calculate, you can't use those easy back-of-the-envelope calculations. So don't forget that. It's not that hard to do, but you've got to do it right. There's a, there's, a sh there's a shorthand version of way to do this, and this is, this is from the FHWA manual, so um, this, this uh, should work fine. And, and this works really only for a simple flow net like, like this one. This, this will not work for the, this previous flow net that I just showed you because it, the, the flow conditions aren't that simple. And what this analysis depends on is the fact that if you look at these cells here, they're, they're fairly close to the same size, which means you have a constant gradient. Uh, your, your I in this direction is fairly constant. And the same thing up here, your I in this direction is, is fairly constant. And, and that's, I'm, I'm not going to go through the derivation, but it depends on the fact that you have pretty uniform, formally shaped flow net going through there. Now, things change down here, but that's, that's something that you ignore in this one. And so if you do that, um, on the, on the upstream side, obviously, you're going to have higher than, um, than, than um, static pore pressure. On the downstream side, you're going to have lower. So if this is, um, if this is the pore pressure that you'd have uh, for the free surface, you're going to have higher pore pressures on the upstream side and lower pore pressures on the downstream side. And you can convert those into a uh, net water pressure like this. And, and your um, design manual shows you how to do that. What I want to point out is that's a simplification to this very simple flow net. Don't go try and apply in that when you don't have a flow net that basically has a constant gradient on this side and a constant gradient on that side. Otherwise, you're not going to get the right answer at all. Um, but it's, but this, is a, this, if you need, this is a nice uh, way to deal with the pore pressures in design um, to do a simple calculation. You don't, need a, you don't need a complicated program to do it. All right, so let's talk about a little more about drainage and reducing pore pressures. So, so we don't want water behind a wall. There are, there are, if you're doing a, a if you're doing an excavation support and there's a high groundwater table and you can't dewater, you're going to have water behind the wall and you can't do anything about it and you have to design for it. But you would like not to design for it. So make sure that you're putting a free draining backfill in. If you're in a position where you can't get enough high quality backfill to completely fill the failure surface behind it and you got some clay, make sure that at least you have free draining material right against the wall so that you, whatever, whatever pore pressures or, or water that's back there can be, can be dissipated. Uh, make sure there's a place for the water to go. You need to have weep holes or back drain or you should have both. It do, if you don't have any place for the water to go, it doesn't matter whether your backfill is freely draining. The water's got to go someplace. So make sure you have drains. Uh, make sure you protect, protect those drains uh, with a filter fabric or you design a, a, a soil filter so that you don't pipe the materials out behind the wall. I've seen a great picture of a, of a retaining wall that right in front of every weep hole there was a little uh, alluvial fan deposit from all the water, all the soil that was being piped out behind the wall through the weep holes. Probably not a good idea. So make sure you've got a, a filter fabric there to pre prevent it. Uh, you can use composite drain material on the back of the wall, and I'll show you a picture of that. And if I remember next time, I'll bring a piece of it in. This is that composite drain material. Um, I don't have anything on here for scale, but um, this stuff is only like you know, maybe like half an inch thick. And so it has, it has a filter. It has usually a non-woven uh, needle-punched uh, filter fabric on the back side, and then it has a rigid uh, thing that looks like a, I don't know, like an egg carton or something. And, that, and that's where the water flow is within this surface, and this is the filter. And you just put them up the back side of the, of the wall. They're very uh, easy to put on, and they work pretty well. Um, 
So that's dealing with water. So now let's talk about um, how to pick the appropriate uh, earth pressure design method. This, this um, diagram comes from a text I used last time I taught this class, but I didn't like the text well enough to make you spend $150 on it. Um, but this is a good figure. Um, so these are a bunch of questions to ask yourself when you're designing a wall. The first one is, is the movement sufficient for me to, re to achieve active pressures behind a wall? So in the case of tieback walls, what's the answer? No. All right? So if the answer is no, uh, then you're going to have to use either one of those empirical earth pressure uh, uh, diagrams, or you're going to have to use a finite element analysis. The finite element analysis is the only thing that has a stress-strain relationship in it, so that's the only way you're going to get the, the, um, the conditions. So if the answer is yes, the next question you want to ask, is the ground surface horizontal? If the answer is no, then you're going to have to either use the graphical wedge method, the, the Coulomb wedge method, or you're going to have to use a, a computer program. Because if the ground surface isn't horizontal, uh, or you can use that, that little um, approximate method I just talked about, but that only works in a, in a few cases. If the groundwater is horizontal, then the next question is, is the ground surface planar behind the wall? Or close enough to planar that you can make it approximate? It doesn't matter if it's horizontal, but it has to be planar. Because both, what, what's one of the assumptions of both Rankine and Coulomb theories? That the back surface is planar. Now, if you have a back surface that, if this is your wall and your back surface is stepped, but it kind of goes up like this, you can say, well, that's, you know, you can put an average point. That's probably fine. But if you have a, if this is your wall and it, you know, it goes back and there's a, there's a big bench and then it comes up and you can't put a planar surface through it, 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 it you know, if you can't put anything that's like a planar surface, you know, especially if you've got some big surcharge load here, then, then you, you can't even assume it's planar. So if the answer is no, then you're going to have to use a graphical met wedge program or some computer program to do that. If the answer is yes, uh, then are your soil layers horizontal? If the answer is no, you're going to go back to have to use a computer program. If the answer is yes, then you can use your classical earth pressure theories. And we already talked about layered systems, even though it's not really the way it works. You're just going to assume in a layered system, if you have horizontal layers, you're just going to assume for each layer that you get whatever earth pressure would be in that layer. So you're going to end up with an earth pressure diagram that can look pretty funky. could look like that. And that was your, yeah, you had that in the last homework problem, right? I think I gave you a layered problem, right? Um, okay, so that's a nice little decision chart for you to, to go through. All right, so let's look at earth pressure models for this. Uh, what, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to look at the models that we're going to use for various kinds of, of, of retaining wall systems. So if we're looking at a concrete cantilever retaining wall, this is the free body diagram we use. We actually assume that all this soil behind the heel just actually goes along for the ride with the wall. Uh, we apply our active earth pressures here. You can use either Rankin or Coulomb. It's really common to use Rankin for this. As you saw from the uh, information that we looked at uh, on Tuesday, Coulomb would be better. But Rankin's, Rankin's OK for active. So this is very, very common. Uh, and here's the issue with these, is what do you do for the passive pressure? So you could, um, you, should, you should definitely use the log spiral method to calculate your, active earth, your passive earth pressure coefficients. But the question is, how much soil do you depend on being there? Well, this is an interesting question. Uh, some people do this. Some people do that. If you do the second one, you'd better be sure that somebody's not going to come along here with a ditch witch sometime, open up a hole here, and put a utility line in right there. Go all the way along the front of your wall with a ditch witch, open up a nice big 6 inch or 12 inch wide hole, leave it open for a couple of weeks while they get around to putting the utility in and start putting the utility in. Because if they do that, definitely not going to be that first earth pressure diagram. And if they go all the way down here, definitely not going to be either one of those. Now, if there's a concrete slab across here and it's never gonna, nothing's ever going to happen, then maybe you can use that one. Lots of times people put in a key. They think that's going to help. Well, then what earth pressure diagram to use? To use that one? To use this one? Sa same issue. Or do you just use this one? I've seen people do just that. 
So um, what I will say for sure is you definitely don't want you definitely want to be using uh, the um, log spiral Ks if you want to get a good K. If you want just a conservative one, you can go ahead and, and uh, use Rankin. Um, and I think in general the best earth pressure, the I'm sorry, the most reasonable one to use is generally this one. If you're confident there's not going to be excavation down below there. It's, there's pretty good evidence, by the way, that when you have a key here and it does slide, that it doesn't generate this whole earth pressure, that it actually slides along this line. And, and it, I mean, there's, why, why would the soil fail all the, along this surface when it could fail right along that surface and come up like that? Um, okay. When we have a, a, a gravity wall with soil right behind it, then we take the free body diagram just to be of the wall itself. Um, and it's, it's appropriate in this case to use a Coulomb because you're definitely going to have sliding along the face of the wall. The reason Rankin works okay for the cantilever retaining wall is because this is actually a soil to soil interface there. It's not a soil to wall interface. So it's okay to use the Rankin for that one. Um, but you're definitely better off using a Coulomb for uh, a large gravity wall. And you're not going to see those very often, but, but you might run into those. Uh, for a, a gabion or a modular wall that has modules that are put together like this, we usually draw a, a um, free body diagram that, that surrounds the modules themselves and then uh, again apply the earth pressure back there. Coulomb is again better than Rankin. And if we have a tight or braced excavation, we're going to be using these apparent earth pressure envelopes to design our wall because we're not going to get the displacements and these have little or nothing to do with active earth pressures. They're all empirically developed. We'll spend some time talking about them when we get to excavation support. Okay, I'm now going, going to go through the, the recommendations. I started with all the recommendations in the FHWA manual and some of them are really good. Some of them are kind of confusing and some of them I think deserve a little more information. So I tried to use the ones that are in the, in the FHWA manual you're using. Um, so for the undrained analysis, when you do an undrained analysis, that's a phi equals zero, you're going to ignore any water pressure. The shear strength is going to be, well, SU, KA, you know, phi equals zero, so KA is equal to KP is equal to one. For cut walls, uh, where you're installing a wall system like a secant wall or tangent wall or diaphragm wall, you know, when you're drilling in there and you're putting these walls in, you're obviously disturbing the soil. So that undrained shear strength right against the back of the wall is going to not be the in situ one, but it's going to have something to do with the, the disturbance that you had to the soil. On the, on the other hand, a little ways behind the wall, you're going to have the undrained shear strength. So, you know, what shear strength do you use? Well, there's some recommendations for that. Uh, for the active case, um, FHW, so FHWA distinguishes what they call C wall, which is the cohesion, the, the, the adhesion against the wall. So they recommend that they use an adhesion that's half of the undrained shear strength. This is to account for this disturbance, but no greater than 1,000 PSF. Um, then they recommend that the earth pressure is equal to sigma z, Remember, this is sigma d times, times Ka, and Ka is 1. Plus, by the way, this is, a, this is a correction to the equation that's in the, in the FHWA manual. I, I've got an email query out to them. Um, they've got a 1 in their in the equation. It doesn't make any sense to me, and I'm pretty sure it's a typo. So um, I'm pretty sure this is correct, but, but you circle that equation in the, in the design manual, because it's definitely not right the way it's written there, and I'm pretty sure this is correct. But they're recommending that you use, instead of two times, remember the, the, um, the active earth pressure is, is sigma times Ka minus two times the square root of Ka times C. So they're recommending for that, that you, instead of just using two times SU, that you use two times the square root of the ratio of CW over SU. So this accounts for the fact that right against the wall you've got disturbed soil, but farther back you've got some other soil. So it's a way of averaging those two. Um, um, but near the surface, 
you know, where you have really small sigmas, you're going to get negative values. So don't, you know, don't put a negative value. The, 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 it's not, the wall's not going to get sucked back by the tension crack that occurs at the surface. In fact, in the tension crack in the surface, you want to put water pressure in because it could fill it with water and you can have water pressure on it. So if there, when, there, when you get the tension crack up there or you do your designs, you assume that tension crack opens up and it fills with water while you're you know, doing you know, right and you've got to add that water pressure back in. That has nothing to do with earth pressure. That has to do with having a hole in the ground that's full of water. Um, they also recommend using a, a minimum sigma A of 30 PSF times Z. And that seems appropriate to me, too. So for the passive case, oh, this is a, th this, um, this is a maximum wall friction coefficient. Um, they have this table in there, which is, this, this table comes out of, um, it's originally in the NAFAC, you see a lot of places. If you have something other, if you've got a rough, if you've got a doing a secant wall and you're drilling down and it's a really rough surface, then you can assume that you get at least half of the, the um, CW. But if you've got a smoother wall, like a steel wall or something, you might want to come in here and use um, these uh, interface adhesion values um, instead of uh, the one. You need to check these too, I guess is what I'm saying. Uh, that half times SU is the maximum you should use. So if you, you've got a sheet pile wall, it might be less than that because the adhesion between the steel and the, and the sheet pile might be less than that. That table's in, your, in the FHWA manual too. So in the passive case, um, again, you should use um, one half of SU, in this case they say, but less than 500 PSF. And again, now your, your lateral earth pressure is going to be uh, sigma Z times plus two times the square root of the, of the ratio of the two, um, of the adhesion to the, to the uh, undrained shear strength times the shear, undrained shear strength. Um, but for fill walls, hopefully none of this applies because if you're doing a fill wall, you shouldn't be using cohesive backfill material. But if you're doing a cut wall, you, this is when this, this uh, analysis comes into play. All right. Is that okay? You want, you want more time on that slide? Are we good? Okay, for the drain analysis. Okay, for the drain analysis, our shear strength is going to be, uh, if we have an overconsolidated clay, it's going to be equal to uh, C prime times sigma prime tan phi prime, and we'll use a peak value, or it's going to be to uh, S is equal to um, sigma times the fully softened friction angle, or S times uh, Sigma times the residual angle if we think we have residual conditions. So uh, in this case, the Coulomb analysis seems acceptable. Uh, in fact, it seems like it's the it's the better one than Rankin. Um, the maximum wall friction angle you should use, uh, it looks like from the analysis, if you look at the data from Princess's lab test, is two thirds of phi. But again, that's a maximum. If you if you actually have inter interface between, so that that would be an appropriate one, for instance, to use in this case where you know you're going to have soil to soil kind of action or a very rough back, or in. Um, the uh, cantilever retaining wall, where you really know what's going on here, is a soil-to-soil -soil interface. It's not a soil-to-wall interface. If you truly have a soil-to-wall interface, uh, such as uh, something like uh, this, or if you've got sheet piles, then you definitely want to come here and check the uh, wall interface friction angles and see if they're going to be less than two-thirds of phi. So that's a maximum. Make sure you understand that, that that's a maximum value of delta. Um, that's what I just said. So maybe lower for some materials. Make sure you check that table. Uh, Rankin is OK, but not as good as Coulomb. It's clear, it was clear from that stuff we looked at uh, yesterday, uh, Tuesday that, that Coulomb is a better fit. Um, 
And so what are you going to do for the earth pressures? Uh, if you have cohesion, if there's a cohesion term you're actually going to use, um, then your earth pressure is going to be Ka times sigma z, sigma z prime. Again, you're going to be subtracting twice the, uh, the cohesion. Uh, but you're going to, and remember, it normally would be, this, this part of the equation would normally be 2 times the square root of K, uh, Ka uh, times C, um, C prime in this case. But we're going to, again, weight it by uh, C, the, the wall adhesion over the, the in situ undrained shear strength. Well, not the undrained shear strength in this case, the, the in situ uh, cohesion. So that's just a way, again, to account for the difference between what's going on right at the wall face and what's going on some distance behind the wall face. Again, this uh, correct this equation in FHWA, it's, it's, it's wrong in there again. Uh, this, this number can give you a negative number near the surface again, right? If it gets negative near the surface, don't do that. There's two ways you can there's two ways you can deal with the fact that you can get negative uh, numbers near the surface. One is you can just reduce your cohesion near the surface, just take it down to zero near the surface, so that you don't get any negative pressures. Or well, the second one you can do is you can limit the total horizontal force to this 30, uh, the whole total horizontal stress to 30, uh, 30 psf times z. Again, this is a total force so that includes the water pressure. So if you've got water pressure, if, if, if you've got water up the surface and you're not getting any negative pressures because your total pressure is, you've got the water pressure there, don't worry about it. But don't, put, don't let yourself get negative pressures near the surface that would theoretically suck your wall back because it's not going to happen. Okay, for the passive case, um, again, we're going to have, uh, for the drain analysis for the passive case, we're going to have this strength. You definitely should be using the log spiral to get your KPs. Um, so we're going to have a similar equation here. In, in this case, remember this term normally would be uh, 2 times the square root of KP times C prime. But again, we're going to weight it by this ratio of the wall adhesion versus the, in, the uh, free field adhesion or cohesion. Um, what you select for delta and, and phi prime and, and the point of action of the wall is going to depend, again, whether you have a, uh, your soils dense, both, both on the density and the wall movement direction. Remember, we, this, this was very clear from the data in the, lab, in the labs. So if you have a loose sand, then progressive failure is not a problem, and you can just use your peak friction angle. Um, and if your wall is just translating, a delta equal to zero is appropriate. Um, if you have a, if the, the delta is going to be negative if the wall gets pulled up, uh, and, and it's probably about half of phi if the wall is moving down while it translates, and that comes from the laboratory data. So you've got to be careful about how you pick delta uh, when you're using the, your passive earth pressure. Uh, the FHA d recommends uh, delta of about one-third of phi, um, and that's probably okay if your wall is moving down, which is the case of a lot of these walls. When, they're, when, they're, when there's failure, the wall relative to the, to the backfill material, this is to the material on the, on the front of the wall, will be moving down. But be careful that it's not moving up. So you could get, you could get if you want to be more conservative there, you can just go in with a delta equal to zero. Um, the point of application may or may not be important, depending on how high the passive area is behind the wall. Um, but if the walls are rotating at about the top, it's clear that, 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 that it's, it's lower than a third of the height of the wall. If the wall's translating, a third seems appropriate. If the wall's rotating about the base, this is shown uh, through laboratory tests, but um, I, I can think of almost no scenarios. I can think of a few really bizarre scenarios where the wall might rotate about the base. So I wouldn't worry about that one too much. But it'll probably, uh, it'll probably be acting a little um, lower than um, one third of the height of the wall. A little higher, I mean, point, point 0.2, no, no point two, I'm sorry, lower, point 0.2 instead of point 0.3. Okay, so our conclusions. 
Okay. Um, sand. For the passive case, if you have dense sand, progressive failure um, almost always applies. So, you know, when, when you have dense sand and you're on the active side, I mean, I mean the passive side, uh, um, you're almost always going to get uh, progressive failure. So, um, this recommendation comes from um, um, Olson at Texas. Um, but he recommends reducing your friction angle uh, by a factor of R, where R of R equal to 0 0.5, so you have a 0 0.5 over here, where you've got the, the, the peak and the residual uh, friction angles. This is for sands, so you only have two. You only got a peak and residual. And this is the fee you want to be using. So if you want to write that out in terms of fee, to use a fee prime, that's one half of the peak minus the residual divided by the peak. So that's some friction angle that's in between the two. Um, delta, delta of a 0 0.5 seems appropriate for translating walls, or maybe 2 thirds uh, for a wall rotating about the base. Uh, the point of application in this case is going to be higher than a third uh, for walls that rotate about the base and about a third for walls that translate. Um, and Clay's in the passive case. Um, for normally solidated consoles, then you can use um, your peak angle and, and with uh, zero cohesion. For over-consolidated soils, it's probably best to use the uh, fully softened strength, again, with no cohesion. And if, there any, whoops, and if there's any reason you think you might get to the, if, there, if there's, you know there's pre-existing shear uh, planes and stuff, uh, then you might want to use the residual. If you're in a situation where you need to do the residual, well, first of all, the residual is so low that it probably isn't helping you anyway. But if you're in a situation like that, maybe you just don't want to depend on any passive pressure on that side of the wall for the, for the short-term analysis. I'm sorry, for the long-term analysis. Questions? So about half of those recommendations come out of the FHWA manual, and about half of them don't. So I would reread re through that section. Pay attention to the equations very carefully, because some of them in there, I'm, I'm, I'm sure the ones that are in there are wrong, and I'm 60 to 80% sure the ones that I've got here are right, but the ones i got here are sure better than the ones that are in there, because the ones there are definitely wrong. The good news about it is the errors are all in the cohesion term, and if you don't have to deal with cohesion, you don't have to worry about it. But. All right. Everybody happy? All right. Uh, please, um, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and stop this.